Welcome to the Cult Creator Experience. Successful content creation to build powerful connections. A podcast designed to help passionate experts and entrepreneurs launch a podcasting platform, successfully build a following, and become industry leaders. Hi, I'm Matt, and I'm the founder of Cult Media and the host of this podcast. I'll be sharing my experience and insights of over 15 years of content creation. And along the way, I'll be seeking out other cult creators to learn from their wisdom and expertise. In today's episode, we jump straight into the action. We're talking about podcasting practicals, recording your first show, and making your vision become a reality. This is the production phase of the cult creator experience, and in it, I share detailed information about workflows, recording environments, some podcasting kit, how to practice, and performance insights and tips. And I'm going to avoid making this episode all about audio brands and the supposed best tech for podcasting today. This information quickly becomes outdated. And as you will learn, I don't think it's as important as the Facebook groups might lead you to believe. But before we enter the studio, turn our phones to airplane mode and step up to the mic, please take a second to follow us on Instagram at cult.media and on your podcasting app of choice. If you have been following this show from the start, you will know that I'm a big fan of planning before we do anything. And so far, we've made personal goals, we've imagined the ideal listener, we've designed our podcasting product, we've utilized pre-production to map out our podcasting life cycle, and now we build our production workflow. So let's start with the basics. What is a workflow? Well, here's a definition. A workflow consists of a coordinated and repeatable pattern of activity enabled by systems and processes that transforms materials, provides services, or processes information. In our case, we take the objective of producing content and we break it down into smaller tasks that we can replicate over and over. So for each recording session, there should be a checklist to help you remember everything, be more efficient with time and allow for delegation. Sounds fun? A good example of a workflow you may have already started is to create your podcast launch strategy. You'll have a list of all the tasks you need to do to get the show live, artwork, recording, editing, promoting, etc. So we can utilize all of your hard work in pre-production to create a workflow that suits your podcast. Now, everyone's podcast production workflow is going to be different, depending on the show format, your budget, equipment, and the subject matter. And this is why it's so important to write yourself a checklist to see if there are any improvements or something missing. Many podcasting gurus will share their exact workflow, but that is only a workflow that works for them and not for your individual needs. Saying that though, I have produced a series of pod guides that features handy checklists at the end of each guide. And these checklists are the fundamentals that every podcaster should follow, not a step-by-step guide to my personal workflow. Just the things that everyone should do in every podcast. I will add the links to these free guides in the show notes and they are in my Instagram bio too. you might be thinking great okay so a workflow is a series of tasks that I'm going to do repeatedly and I can delegate great can you give me an example yes I can so let me share a workflow that I have recently created for a client who specifically uses the Rode Rodecaster Pro setup and this will give you an idea of what you could include in your production workflow are we ready step one plug in Rodecaster Pro power two connect microphones Then connect your headphones, then connect all of the AUX devices, and insert a memory card. Then we'll power up the Rodecaster Pro. Noticed I didn't turn it on when I plugged it in, I waited until everything was connected, then I turned it on. Next, uh, you will select the mic channels. I'll adjust the input level into the green markers. If you've got a Rodecaster Pro, you'll know what that means. I will select the mic type. In this case, I'm using condenser. Select processing. Usually, I only have the low pass filter on. 
And in this case, we'll select the voice setting, which is off. Next, we will head to the menu and we'll go to channel and we'll set up the Bluetooth. We'll set up the AUX input and we'll set up the USB input if relevant and required. Then we'll go into the advanced settings and we'll make sure that the SD card has enough memory. We'll make sure the headphone settings are suitable for our needs and we'll ensure that the audio is recording in multi-track to the memory card. And we will set the date and time. Good housekeeping, just in case things get separate. You know, you want to know when it was that we recorded that. You can look for the file and see. Next in the workflow is setting the channel faders to the right levels and setting the monitor levels to appropriate levels too. Then we press the big record button. We record our podcast and then we press the same button to stop the podcast. And then the next thing we do is we immediately jump into the menu. We go into settings, we go to podcast and we make sure that what we recorded did actually record. And that is the production workflow. So if you need a hand producing your workflow, drop me a message in social media or matt at cult.media and I'll give you a hand and see if there's anything missing from there that can make your life easier. Now the next step after you've produced that production workflow is to test it. Yeah, that's right. Test it. Honestly, I have worked with podcasters that waited until the recording session to test their kit. And you guessed it, stuff went wrong. There was nothing wrong with the workflow we had written, but the kit itself was not performing as it should. And this is frustrating because most of the kit was new as well. So set yourself up for success by getting some dress rehearsals under your belt with your podcasting kit. But we'll come back to this point a little bit later. Now I mentioned delegation and delegation is an important point. Up till now, it's been about you, the cult creator, establishing your podcast. But life doesn't always allow for you alone to spend every minute producing podcasts. It must be nice. If it does, though, it must be very nice. In fact, I can bet money that there are certain aspects of being a content creator that you will dislike, or even possibly hate. And as a leader, it is important to know what to delegate and when to get your hands dirty. So as you create your podcast, keep an eye out for those tasks that you love, the tasks that take far too much time, and the tasks that you dislike and dread. And we should seek help for the latter too. Delegating and outsourcing is actually a brilliant way to define a clear workflow. You will need to instruct a third party exactly how they can assist you with your podcast. And you know what they say, never assume it makes an ass out of you and me. So make sure that your instructions or workflow are comprehensive and clear to follow. If you have a thought that something should be obvious or that common sense will be apparent at this point, don't. Just don't. Never leave anything to chance or put the person helping you in a position to make a mistake. Look out for the red flags of people saying things like, I think I know how to, or it's pretty simple really. Even if they say, I've done something similar for someone else. Just double check. It will save time and uncomfortable situations. And if you're in doubt, ask someone. There's lots of communities out there on social media, forums, and from coaches like me. Once you have a workflow, there are lots of tools and apps to help you manage these tasks. And I think it's really important to have some form of project management. Once you have a workflow, there are lots of tools and apps to help you manage these tasks. And I think it's really important to have some form of project management. It definitely saves on repetition of tasks that might have already been done, and it can make delegation of tasks far more simple. It could be a basic spreadsheet. It could be a free PDF checklist from me, or it could be a sophisticated piece of software that allows for automation, time management, and delegation. It's really only about you and your preferences as to what platform you want to use. I personally use an app called ClickUp to manage my podcast series and other people's podcasts, and it can do a whole lot more than I actually use it for. If I'm honest, I should probably find a consultant to help me utilize that app further. 
Other apps I've used include Asana, Trello, Basecamp, Notion, obviously spreadsheets. They're all great tools with their own unique features and drawbacks. And maybe I should do an episode in the future just about project management tools because there's so many out there. We'll save that for the next series though, right? And one final thing I would like to add to my workflow section. Data management. Oh, sexy, right? Yes, what you do or do not do with your audio and video files. If a file is not backed up in at least three places, it is not backed up in my opinion. So consider the best processes for you to build in some redundancy to your workflow as an insurance policy against losing your content. Whether that be cloud backups or having clone hard drives, or even that when you record your podcast, you might have another recorder running at the same time to ensure that it definitely gets captured. It's entirely up to you. Again, get in touch if you have any questions. I will try and help you develop some redundancy in your production workflow. If you have already downloaded my free pod guide series from the website, you'll see that one of the points I made in both the practical podcasting checklist and in the top tips to be the best podcast guest is finding an optimum recording space. For those of you that haven't read the pod guides, here are my prerequisites for a optimal podcast recording space. Hire a recording studio with a sound engineer. No, I'm joking, sorry. But going to a dedicated space or studio for a podcast is strongly recommended, but not always possible and definitely incurs a cost, right? So what can we look for if we are at home or in our office? To start off with, we need to find a quiet environment. No air conditioning, no extraneous noise, no distraction, and definitely no public spaces. We should seek to find rooms with soft surfaces. Keep the curtains closed, reduce the amount of hard, flat, reflective surfaces. Small rooms can offer a little bit less echo, and you can hang some duvets or blankets around the room to reduce that echo if you have a nasty one. You can try clapping to see how the sound bounces around the room you're looking at. Next, you should be comfortable. Sit where you are comfy and set up around you. You might be recording for a while. Now, this means bringing the mic to you, not the other way around. Trust me, your back will thank me. And if you're filming a video podcast, fancy, consider what is in the background. We've all seen those awkward news clips with people with odd items on the shelves in the backgrounds or just kids being kids in the background. And that brings me to mention to remind those around you that you are recording a podcast. Let the family and your co-workers know that you're not to be disturbed, to keep the noise to a minimum and that you're just not going to be around for 45 minutes to an hour. And remember our dear old friend, airplane mode, on our phones and do not disturb on our computers. Let's not let a chirping alert taint our podcast experience for our followers. And lastly, try to be consistent. Find a space you can access easily and at suitable times for you. This will make editing quicker, improve your quality of your audio for your listener and help form good workflow habits by being in that same space, having the same setup. It's just good to sort of generate that workflow as a habit. The most discussed point for any content creator is the technology. And I'm not going to tell you the best mic or the best kit to record in this episode. And to be fair, I can't. There is no perfect kit list. It is about you and your podcast. For me, there are three deciding factors when it comes to purchasing podcast equipment. They are time, money, and expectations. Time. How complex can the setup be to allow you to use it efficiently and effectively? You don't want something overly complicated that sets you back every time. And if tech makes you frustrated or anxious, keep it simple. They say perfection is the enemy of progress. So let's try and avoid the setup of your recording being an excuse 
for you not to do it. Money. Now, money is very subjective, and I do believe you should buy the best you can afford at the time. We discussed budgets in the previous episode of the podcast, and this is one of those moments that a holistic approach is required to ensure we spread the budget evenly across key areas. So am I saying buy the cheapest? No. Am I saying buy the most expensive? Definitely not. But buy cheap and buy twice is a phrase that comes to mind. And I've been buying audio tech since I was around 13, and this has always been true. If a device is cheap and does more than the average market leader, I question how good the build quality and the parts are. But there is a point with technology these days where the noticeable improvement beyond a certain price point is hardly worth the money. And let's not forget that podcasting is primarily published as an MP3 with some pretty serious compression. So that $1,000 microphone will never be heard to its full potential. Expectations. I think the best yardstick to use when it comes to buying podcasting kit is what does your listener avatar expect? Are you a coach trying to sell a £10,000 coaching service to a corporate business? What standards do your ideal clients have? Is it suitable for someone listening to your podcast in their luxury car with their premium surround speakers for it to sound muffled, dull, full of hiss, or the massive cathedral sounding echo? Probably not. If your show is just for fun or your target demo are listening to anything and everything on your subject matter, then we probably don't need to worry too much about the listener bias. But this doesn't mean that clarity and intelligibility get forgotten for our listeners' experience. After all, we are making this podcast for them, right? And those three factors are what I look for when purchasing kits for my clients. And this is something I started when I was preparing the Vice Vent podcast in 2019, was I built a dynamic shopping list made in Google Sheets. And this had items that build up into kits and each item had two or three options in different price brackets. It made it super easy to see where we could and couldn't spend money, depending on the content we wanted to create, and of course, the all-important budget. So Matt, what do I need to purchase to start a podcast? And this is a Facebook group favourite. The fundamentals for any recording setup never change. There is an input a capture of the input, a storage of the captured media, and finally, the output. Let me give you two examples. This first one is as simple as I can think of. The input is the microphone in your phone. The capture is internal, and we capture it using the Voice Memo app. The storage is on your phone's memory and the cloud backup if you have one. And the output are the headphones that you connect to your phone via Bluetooth or a cable. A slightly more complex version of this could be your input is a Sontronics Podcast Pro mic. Capture is via an XLR cable into a Rodecaster Pro Desk. The storage is a micro SD card and the output is headphones or speakers connected to the desk. When we make the process more complicated, we need more supplementary items and peripherals like cables, stands, mounts, computers even, more inputs, more outputs. But the four stages never change. Input, capture, storage, output. Even if we're using remote recording apps like Riverside FM or in some dire circumstances, Zoom, We choose our input, the recording method, where it's going to record to, and the output. Zoom saves a compressed file to a server, and Riverside records locally on the device and uploads after. And one final suggestion on podcasting kit is not to buy it until you know it's a keeper. I have had coaching sessions and been paid to create strategies for people that have spent $2,000 plus on kit without truly knowing what they wanted to create or why. 
And you know what? They didn't even go on to produce a podcast. So try before you buy is always advised. And I know some of you might be saying, well, how can I do this if I don't have an audio rental supplier local to me? Well, my tip for this, and this is a big part of podcasting, is to network. You'll need to find guests and you'll definitely need to engage with your listeners. So why not join some podcasting groups online or local to you to see if you can meet some people and ask if you can borrow or rent gear from other podcasters. You never know who you might meet. With any new venture, it feels like a lot to learn at the start. And this is why it's critical to practice using the kit you buy. And a big part of this is getting used to the sound of your own voice. The reason we dislike it is to do with the way that we don't perceive certain frequencies when we speak out loud. Our body and our head absorb some of the sound as we project it. And this is why we feel like recordings of our voices sound so unfamiliar. I always think I sound like one of the Muppets when I listen back to my own recordings, like Fozzie Bear or just a sad Ernie maybe. So try to get comfortable with your tone and how you speak. I do not suggest trying to change it. It is more hassle and stress than it's worth. Be yourself and learn to love it. Don't worry, I still struggle now and I've been producing audio for years. While you're practicing with the kit, you'll begin to tune your ear to how the kit sounds. Moving the mic further from or closer to your mouth will make the tone warmer or enhance clarity. And we dive into microphone techniques in my free pod guide as well as in the Cult Leader program. Something I say to all of my clients and cult leaders is break the kit. This doesn't mean grabbing mics and pretending to be in the Sex Pistols at the end of a gig. What I mean is to make sure you know what the limits are of the setup you have. Learning how an overdriven mic sounds, or what happens when you have an open mic next to your speakers, is the best way to learn how it all works. And I must reiterate that smashing or being overly aggressive repeatedly to your equipment will result in failure and lighter wallets. I don't want any letters about microphones going into hotel swimming pools, okay? And this leads me nicely on to my next point. It's almost like I script this podcast, right? The next point is to build a backup. Over time, you'll upgrade your kit and you'll have some spare tech around the house in a drawer just in case. But when you start, you don't have 110 microphones and enough XLR cables to create a Kevin McAllister zipline across the garden. But you do need to consider a backup. This might be just your phone and using voice memo again. But the important thing is not to miss an opportunity to produce content. Especially if you have arranged to have a guest on or you've taken the time out of your schedule to do this. Again, Don't spend money you don't have. Just try and put in place the best backup plan you can. My last talking point is performance. The most obvious factor when it comes to performance is how you present your podcast. How do you want to be received by your audience? What sort of energy do you need to bring to meet the expectation of your followers? What style of show meets your podcasting promise or content commitment? If you promise fun and exciting, you better show up like Tigger and not like Eeyore. Whatever you choose, make sure it's replicable and you are comfortable. Don't push yourself out of your comfort zone that you don't feel like you're being yourself. Rehearse, do some pilot segments, get some feedback from your audience or people near you. And please Please, please, remember to have fun though. This doesn't need to be a chore. Even if your show isn't happy clappy energy or the subject matter is hard hitting, enjoy the process of creating your incredible content and your audience will hear it in your performance. The next element to performance is the various roles and responsibilities you have as a podcaster. 
At any one time, you can be a producer, a host, an engineer, a runner, an interviewer, a production manager, marketeer, accountant, and most important, you are a representative for your listeners. And that's a lot, right? But by acknowledging that you are handling these roles and responsibilities is the key to minimising stress. Don't beat yourself up if mistakes happen because you are doing five things at once and for the first time. It can help to write out the roles and their responsibilities to triage tasks at any given moment. And this can help you further with delegating. My third consideration for performance is on the people side of things. How do you perform under pressure? How do you deal with conflict? How do you manage others is all part of a high-performing podcast. Key skills like being organised, focused and being able to practice active listening skills are all present in the leading podcasts of the day. The people side of content creation is what gives you authenticity and authority in your niche. You need to be empathetic to your audience and your contributors. You need to be able to manage ego both in yourself and maybe that troublesome guest or two. Let the content do the work and don't make excuses to not get the job done. We are all fearful of making mistakes and feeling vulnerable when we put ourselves out into the world. And being able to perform under these conditions is no small feat. So give yourself some credit, think of others and do good stuff. And that, my friend, was production. And with as little microphone jargon as possible. Now, don't get me wrong, I love the tech side of podcasting and audio. But for most cult creators, it doesn't matter what name your microphone has on it. It's more about how effective, efficient and purposeful the production process is for you as a podcaster. Remember to be looking to try and batch record and try and get five to ten episodes in the can ahead of time, if possible. But I know some content doesn't allow for this level of preparation. So to summarise what I have shared today. We covered the wonder that is workflows, project management and delegating tasks. We addressed podcasting's greatest challenge, the recording environment and how to find the best space to make your audios. I shared my considerations behind purchasing podcasting equipment and why quality matters. Practice, practice and practice some more to hone your craft and try and break your equipment, but not repeatedly. And finally, the art of performing podcasting and how to be a high performance podcaster. And this might be my longest episode to date, I think. Uh, They are steadily getting longer as I improve my brain dumping technique. Maybe by episode 10, we'll have some sort of three-hour epilogue where I can change the world. Or not, we shall see. I'd like to thank you for listening and being a part of the Cult Creator Experience. And I'm always happy to get feedback. And if you have any questions or topics you'd like me to discuss, please reach out. And if you want to start your own Cult Creator Experience and become a cult leader in your industry, head to cult.media to get your free strategy session. And until next time, be good.